Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in Mark chapter 14. We're going to finish the chapter this morning. Last week we considered the trial of Christ before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish trial, and in the next chapter, chapter 15, it's Christ before Pilate in a Roman court of law. But in between, we have this incident of Peter in the courtyard, verses 66 through 72. Really, I think the place to begin our reading is back in verse 54, when the arresting army came for Jesus in the garden and led him away. We read in verse 54, Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. And now that incident is picked up in verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow in a word of prayer. F.B. Meyer was an English minister. He was known, though, internationally. He was a friend of the American evangelist Dwight L. Moody. He was a popular preacher and prolific writer. He wrote a number of popular books on biblical characters. In the one he wrote on Peter, he said, Peter comes nearer to us than any of his brother apostles. That's probably true, if only because we know him um, and about him more than we know uh, the rest of the other 11. We know about his successes, and we know very well about his failures, which were dramatic. The most dramatic of all happened during the Lord's trial when the apostles' faith and loyalty were put to the test, and he had a complete collapse of courage. So if Peter comes nearer to us than any of the other apostles, then he is an important apostle to study. And what we learn from him is how prone we are to wander, how weak we are in ourselves. But what we also learn from him is spiritual failure follows a path, and it can be traced. Sin doesn't just happen. There's a reason for it. How is it that a man can sit with our Lord and be in the light of his teaching, then a few hours later be sitting with the Lord's enemies, warming himself by their fire? How is it that a man can profess his love for Christ and vow to lay down his life for him and only a few hours later deny him three times with curses? There's a reason for that. And since we're all very much like Peter, it is to our advantage to know what it is. What is the pathway to failure and sorrow? Peter suffered that sorrow, and he suffered it very gravely. But there's something else we learned from Peter, something 
that gives hope, and that is, where there is great failure, there's great mercy. While we are oftentimes faithless, the Lord is always faithful and forgives. That's the testimony of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We see that clearly in the, the contrast that we have between Jesus and, and Peter in this whole uh, period during that evening. Both men were put on trial. Jesus faced a formal trial, Peter an informal one. Jesus was in a Jewish court and a Roman court of law. Peter was among a gaggle of servants in a courtyard. Both men faced interrogation. Jesus gave the good confession. Peter lied. Peter denied the Lord. But the Lord cannot deny himself. And because of that, he cannot deny his promises to us. And he will never forsake us, even though we may be unfaithful to him. Because he's pledged his faithfulness to us. And not only will he remain faithful to us, he will make something of us. Something of us even though we have been unfaithful to him. Even though we fall and fail just as miserably as Peter did. He made something of Peter after all of this. In spite of his flaws, in spite of his failures, Peter became a mighty servant of the Lord. But he passed through a great trial getting there and shed bitter tears as a result of it. Luke recounts the Lord's warning to Peter that night in the upper room, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Peter wouldn't hear any of it. He vowed his loyalty and value to the death, and he meant it too. But the Lord knew Peter better than Peter knew himself and told him to pray told all of the disciples to pray so they would not enter temptation. When the soldiers came later that night and arrested Jesus, Peter was true to his word. He pulled out a sword and he began to fight. He was ready to die for Christ. He showed real courage. But sometimes, oftentimes, it's far more difficult to be still and wait on the Lord than it is to be active. It takes greater strength to endure a trial calmly than to fight against it. Peter could fight, but he couldn't wait and trust. None of the disciples could. So when Jesus stopped the fight and gave himself over to the enemy and they bound him and led him away, the disciples fled to a man they all abandoned Jesus and ran off into the night. But it wasn't long before Peter got hold of himself and went back. Earlier in verse 54, Mark wrote that when they took Jesus to Caiaphas' house, Peter had followed him at a distance. And we're not told why he did that, we can only guess, but certainly it was because he loved the Lord, he wanted to be near the Lord, he was very, very concerned and wanted to know what would happen to him. He went there out of love. None of the other disciples followed, except one, possibly, or probably John, who, according to John 18, verse 15, was known to the high priest, and through that connection, he was able to get Peter into the courtyard. And we might see some courage in that, again, some courage in Peter. He also followed him and followed him right into the enemy's home. Now that might be some courage, but very little wisdom in that. Peter thought he could do it safely. He thought he could go undetected under the cover of night. It was a cool night. And the servants had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard. They were sitting around it, and according to verses 66 and 67, Peter was there. It's a strange scene. 
Peter, warming himself by the enemy's fire, acting as a secret disciple, hoping to blend in and go unnoticed. I say that's strange, but we all do that sometimes, don't we? I don't know that a Christian can do that for long before he or she is found out and either confesses Christ or denies him. But that's where Peter was, sitting with the enemy. It was a dangerous place. But Peter was feeling confident enough to put himself there and safe enough in the dark. That confidence was shaken, though, when someone recognized him in the firelight. It was one of the servant girls of the high priest. She saw him warming himself and said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. Now John tells us that she was the doorkeeper. So probably she became suspicious of Peter when she first let him in. And so she followed him into the courtyard. She wasn't sure who he was, but she recognized something about him. There was something strange about him. Didn't fit him being there. And so she studied him in the firelight. And suddenly she recognized him and blew his cover. You were with Jesus, she said. He denied it. I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. So the man who just hours before had confidently vowed, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you, cowered before a slave girl and denied Christ for the first time. The flesh is weak. He hoped that would end it. He denied any knowledge of Christ and he went out on the porch, but it wasn't the end. The slave girl followed him and told everyone there, this is one of them. According to Matthew and Mark, other servants joined in. Now Peter faced a fusillade of accusations. Again, he denied it. Then according to Matthew, he moved back to the fire in an effort to to avoid more questions. And things got quiet for a while. Luke says it lasted about an hour. And then it all began to heat up again. Those who were by the fire began approaching Peter, saying, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. Now this time his conversation gave him away. Whenever he talked, it was evidence that he was one of them. He was from the country. He didn't have the urbane accent of a Jerusalemite. And he stood out around that that fire. His own speech betrayed him. In Matthew's account, they said, even the way you talk gives you away. Accent is important in some places. In England, for example, it sets apart the upper class from all others. They, uh, in the upper class, speak with what's called the public school accent, or sometimes it's called the Oxford English. They learn a very refined pronunciation of English, the received pronunciation, and it distinguishes those from the lower classes. It distinguishes the privileged class from the working class. It's very important in England to have the right accent if you want to have a position of power in politics. Peter's pronunciation betrayed him betrayed his working class origin. He was a rustic from the backwater of Galilee. And now they were certain Peter was lying. Of course, he's one of Jesus' disciples. But again, now in a panic, Peter denied it. He began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. He was so earnest in his denial that he brought anathemas down on himself and on the Lord himself. A torrent of four-letter words came pouring out of his mouth. It was a total and profane meltdown. 
Judas increased his wickedness by betraying Jesus with a kiss. Peter added to his sin by denying the Lord with a curse. In fact, curses, cursing himself, cursing the Lord. A comparison between the two men may seem inappropriate because they are very different from one another. Peter loved the Lord, Judas didn't. But at this moment, from their actions, there appears to be no difference at all between them. And, and what that shows is how, how far a true saint can fall. So for all of his self-confidence in the upper room, Peter had stumbled badly in the courtyard. He denied the Lord three times, just as Jesus foretold that he would. Immediately, Mark wrote, a rooster crowed a second time, just as Jesus foretold it would. And at this point in Luke's account, while Peter was denying the Lord, swearing and cursing his denial of Jesus, Luke wrote that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now that's a very interesting scene, and we don't really know where Jesus was at that moment. It may be that, as some have suggested, he was, he was in the window of Caiaphas' house under trial and was able to look down in the courtyard at that moment, or perhaps he was being moved from one trial to another, maybe from Annas' house to Caiaphas' house. But there he was at that moment, providentially in the courtyard, looking at Peter. So as Peter was making this third denial, the rooster crowed, he turned, and there was Jesus staring at him. And at that moment, it all came back to him. Luke wrote that Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. What a moment that was. What a look that was. The eyes of Jesus are penetrating. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 14, we have a description of his eyes. This is a glorious description of our Lord. It's a metaphor. We don't take it literally, but it exhibits the glory of Christ and the power of Christ now as John sees this vision on Patmos. And he described the eyes of the Lord as being like a flame of fire. And here they burned into Peter's soul. Not with a heat of judgment, but with both sorrow for Peter's act and intense concern for his fallen friend. That's the sense that the word look has. This particular word has the idea of a close look, an intense look. In fact, it's used in verse 67 of the slave girl looking closely at Peter at the, the fireside. She's looking intently at him, trying to recognize who this person is. And this is Christ's look at him now. He looked into Peter. But with the Lord, it was not a look of incrimination or accusation, but of interest and love and concern. Sometimes a look can say more than words. Peter was guilty. He was caught in a lie in the very act of sin. And the Lord's look melted Peter's heart. Mark wrote, and he began to weep. That's really an understatement. Matthew said, he went out and wept bitterly. He was a broken man. And here we see the difference between Peter and Judas. The Lord looked at, at Judas also in the upper room. When he gave him the morsel, he looked at him, stared him in the eye, spoke to him. There in the garden, when he was betrayed by Judas, he looked at him. But the look of the Lord didn't stop Judas. He was unaffected by it. Peter was deeply affected. It shattered him. It was a painful moment. But that was the beginning of his repentance and recovery. 
The Lord looks at us today as well. He doesn't look at us physically, of course. But he looks at us through the Scriptures and by the Holy Spirit, and it's every bit as real and every bit as intense as it was there in the courtyard for Peter. He gives us that penetrating look of love and makes us sense our sin and shame and causes us to turn back to Him. That's why it's so vital for you and me to be studying the Scriptures continually. But how much better to study the Scriptures and to learn from them and not to deviate and not to have to repent, to uh, avoid the path that leads to great sorrow and bitter weeping. It can be done. There were reasons for Peter's terrible fall that night. And we learn those reasons and what to avoid as we consider the path that Peter followed. His first step down the path of spiritual defeat was his refused, refusal to believe Jesus' warning. In fact, he challenged the Lord and contradicted him. When Jesus said back in verse 27, you will all fall away, Peter denied it and said, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. Now, he wasn't alone in that. He wasn't the only person that had that, that um, self-confidence. They all vowed the same loyalty. But, but Peter's first step here was unbelief. He rejected the Lord's word. He rejected the revelation that God had given him. He thought better of his own opinions than he did the revelation of Christ that night. Christians do that, don't we? Instead of following God's words and its principles, we live by our own wits and we follow our own feelings. We know what we want and we find a way of, uh, of rationalizing ourselves into having it and doing it. We have our ways of doing that, but in doing so, we don't trust the Lord. We think we're wiser. Well, we wouldn't articulate it that way, but that's, the, that's, that's what we do. We trust ourselves, not the Lord. That's what Peter did. And so the second step in his fall was he thought too highly of himself. He didn't seem to doubt that the other disciples would fail the Lord, but he was convinced that he would not. It's the danger that Paul warns of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, where he wrote, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Be careful of overconfidence. Be careful of self-confidence. Now that doesn't mean that Christians should not live with a, a sense of of a, a positive, optimistic attitude in life. I think we should have that. I think we of all people should be optimistic and should be positive. The Bible doesn't encourage us to be self-loathing or pessimists. It doesn't encourage us to be this introspect, introspective people that are sort of crippled by that kind of thing. It doesn't encourage us to live gloomy lives. We are to be joyful. And we can be joyful because who, of who we are in Christ. That, that's the fruit of the Spirit, among other things. But in that joy and optimism that we should have, there should also be the understanding that we are what we are only by the sovereign grace of God. Know who you are. Paul tells you who you are in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. He says, we are more than conquerors. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's what you are. More than conquerors through Him who loved us. And that's the key. It's only by Him that we stand and don't fall. The Bible is filled with examples of people, good people, mature men of God who didn't take that seriously or at least failed to, at some point, take that seriously. And sometimes it was at a moment of 
great success, a period of great triumph in their lives. That's when they became self-confident and fell. The way we think affects the way we act. If we think we're strong, and when I say that I mean strong in and of ourselves, look at what I've done, look at uh, all that I've accomplished, well then we won't take steps to guard against the looming danger that's always out there. And Peter didn't do that. He didn't pray. And that's the third step in his failure. The Lord told the disciples to pray that night. When they entered the garden, he said, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter didn't do it. He slept instead, and he was unprepared when temptation came. That is a common problem. Most of us, I imagine, have a problem with a consistent prayer life. Don't we all struggle with that? We know it's important to pray. Pray without ceasing, we're told. Do we do that? We have difficulty with a constant, consistent prayer life. So much gets in the way. And, and so we put it off, and we put it off. And maybe we find, what? Well, it's late at night and I haven't prayed yet. I haven't really gotten on my knees and dealt with some things. Or maybe a day or two goes by. And so as a result, we can drift. And so as a result, we can have failures in our life. Peter failed to pray. The fourth step is, in this fall of his, was that he put himself in harm's way. So he wasn't prepared for the temptation. He became confident in himself, and he put himself in a dangerous place. People in the courtyard were not Peter's friends. They were enemies, and I say enemies, they are spiritually different from him. And not the people that were going to encourage Peter to remain faithful to the Lord. Still, we read that he warmed himself at their fire. Luke said, Peter was sitting among them. Now, there's nothing wrong with sitting with unbelievers. There's nothing wrong with living among non-believers, as long as we are open about our faith and we're not trying to conform to them, we're not trying to blend in. Christians can't do that, and it is dangerous to try to do that. Matthew Henry wrote long ago, those that warm themselves with evildoers grow cold towards good people and good things. And those that are fond of the devil's fireside are in danger of the devil's fire. Christ rescued Peter from that fire. And that too is a lesson we learn from all of this. We learn the steps down Peter's path to failure, but we also learn about God's grace in all of this. That is... The only thing that keeps us from the devil's fire, Christ and his ministry for us. In fact, again, the Lord had told Peter about that ministry that very night. Satan would sift him like wheat, the Lord said, and Satan did it. Peter was thoroughly sifted. But the Lord also said to him, I have prayed for you. And Peter survived, survived the trial Sifted but sound, because Christ prayed for him. He prays for all of his people. He's praying for you right now, at this very moment. He prays for you every day, all the time. And that's the reason we survive in this world that is full of temptations and testings and dangers. One of the greatest promises that a believer in Jesus Christ has is that he or she is eternally secure. We have eternal life. And that word defines it all. It means that life can never end. It is eternal, not temporal. 
It's permanent. That's what the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints teaches, that the saints will persevere. They will continue in faith to the end. We're responsible to have faith. We're responsible to believe and to keep our faith and uh, to live by faith and increase our faith. But perseverance in faith is not only our responsibility, it is a promise. It does not depend on our will, but on God's unchangeable love, upon Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice, upon his constant intercession for us and the Holy Spirit who answers Christ's prayers for us. The Trinity is involved in that. We are secure in our triune God. We can stumble in our faith, certainly see that here. This is just an example of what happens to all of us in some way or another. We can fall into sin, we do, as Peter did, and we even continue in it for a time, as David did. He was in his sin for a year. We can lose the assurance of salvation. We don't lose salvation. Saints, true believers, can never totally nor finally fall away from the faith because we are kept by God's grace and the prayers of Christ. We read that very thing in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, that Jesus is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's the assurance that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. That he is presently praying for us, and it is because of his prayers that Peter survived his trials, and, and that you and I will survive ours. In fact, the amazing thing about God's grace is that he not only forgives us, our transgressions and our failures and our falls, but he can use our failures in our lives to actually mature us as Christians and make us useful for his service. He did that with Peter. John records it in John chapter 21, how after all of this, by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus took Peter aside and asked him three times if he loved him. And three times Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. As if to erase those three denials. So the Lord addressed Peter's failure. Doesn't ignore our failures. He brings about resolution. He brings about healing. And after each confession, confession of love by Peter, Jesus told him, Tend my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. The Lord, in effect, reinstated Peter in his service. And Peter, who failed Christ so miserably, did feed the Lord's sheep with great usefulness and boldness throughout his life. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, when he and John were brought in before the Sanhedrin for preaching the gospel in the temple, before the same court that had judged Jesus not too long before, before those same men who had condemned Christ to death, they came in and those very men were amazed at Peter and John. That's the word that Luke uses. They heard, they heard those two men speak. They recognized immediately from their accents that they were working class people. In fact, they commented that they were uneducated and untrained men. They, they didn't go to our schools. They didn't have our training. They hadn't attended Oxford. They were from the country, simple men. And yet, what amazed them is they were articulate. They were powerful in their speech. They gave a bold and clear testimony for the Lord. They had great courage. What a change had taken place through the grace and the power of God. 
God overcomes our failures, and he even uses those failures to teach us and to mature us, to give us wisdom, to give us humility, and make us even more effective in his service and more useful for the sheep, the saints, the people of God. It was A.W. Tozer that said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Peter was hurt deeply in his fall. But out of it came a deeper love for Christ. And out of it came a greater usefulness for others. For weak saints. Weak saints. And that is every one of us. That's what we are in and of ourselves. F.B. Meyer was right. Peter comes nearer to us than any of his brother apostles. So we need to remember that we are weak and the flesh is strong and be watchful and be in prayer continually. Peter teaches us that there is a dangerous path to failure. But also we learn from him that there is recovery. That the Savior is merciful and he keeps us through his power and prayers. Augustus Toplady put it beautifully, I think, in his hymn, A Debtor to Mercy Alone, with the stanza, I to the end shall endure as sure as the earnest is given. The earnest is the Holy Spirit, which he's given to all of us. More happy, but not more secure, the souls of the blessed in heaven. I like that statement. The saints in heaven are more happy than those of us on earth, but they're not more secure than we are. We are just as secure as those who have already entered into glory. That's the blessing that the Lord gives to us. One of the many. Do you have that security? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Salvation is only for those who believe. See your need if you have not. Come to Him. Trust in Christ. He forgives all who do. He receives all who do. He gives them eternal life and blesses them all through this life. God help you to do that. And those of you who have put your faith in Christ, may He strengthen it and give you wisdom. Give all of us wisdom that we would recognize the danger that we would um, keep watch and keep praying. Let's uh, stand and sing that great hymn of Top Lady in the Songs of Praise book, hymn number 11, and then remain standing for the benediction. Thank you for that mercy, mercy that saves the undeserving. Thank you for Christ, for his death for us obtaining us, securing us, redeeming us, and keeping us. What a blessing that is. Thank you. May we live obedient lives out of gratitude for your goodness and grace. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.